Welcome to our third and concluding session on Shalom Aleichem and Shalom Aleichem and Agnon. Uh, we will be uh, trying to wrap things up, make some concluding comments, and uh, but we'll really see how there are certain through lines that we've been talking about last week and the week before, which uh, which will receive a particular attention uh, particular attention tonight. Uh, finally, again, my uh, commercial message trying to promote our summer tour this summer, July 12th to 21st in Prague, Vienna, and Budapest. If you'd like to join us, please visit www.agnonhouse.org.il slash summer2020. This commercial message has been brought to you by some travel agency to promote the Jewish heritage of Central Europe. Prague and Budapest were named two of the most beautiful cities in the world. Vienna didn't make it. Oh, well. It's, it's a beautiful city. Um, so anyway, if you're interested, please, we'd be happy to have you along. It's a very enjoyable and uh, educational uh, uh, trip with really some wonderful, wonderful, uh, wonderful people. The, the, the bad seeds, we managed to weed them out in our coming this summer. Uh, Shalom Aleichem and Agnon, the greatest Yiddish author, the greatest Hebrew author. Uh, you know, the conversation and comparing the two of them, it's always artificial to do these kinds of comparative studies. But there's no doubt that there were certain themes that they both that they both um, dealt with, as did, of course, so many other uh, great Jewish authors in all languages, in Hebrew, in Yiddish, in Judeo-Arabic, in Ladino, in, of course, Russian and German and English as well. And we could take any two authors and find some common thread. But there really is something much deeper, not just because in so many cases you have stories that are built almost as if, well, as I suggested, and I have no evidence for this in any particular story, but almost as if Agnon was saying, very nice, Shalom Aleichem, let me take your story and rewrite it and show you how to do it, do it properly. And we might see another case of that today. Uh, I, I tried, I'm not sure if I succeeded, I tried in giving catchy names before we got started uh, online, we were watching some uh, clips from, uh, from from Fiddler, of course, which is, you know, uh, both uh, with joy and with some sadness, um, a little bit happy, a little bit sad, both uh, laughing through the tears, as, as I think it's said about Shalom Aleichem. Uh, you know, the way in which so many people know his writing are from having seen it on the stage and screen. And we really do owe it to ourselves to go back to the source material and read it, those who can read it in Yiddish, of course, but in any of the very fine translations, because there really are so many differences. I had mentioned that, uh, that uh, I was inspired by the teaching and writing and scholarship of Professor Ruth Weiss, who has this wonderful course that I, I recommend to your attention. You'll, you'll learn so much more about Shalom Aleichem from her than you did, uh, than you did from me. Um, this course that she has on the website of uh, the Tikva Fund, T-I-K-V-A-H, Google it, you'll find it. Uh, I think there's eight lessons, uh, recorded lessons that you can that you can uh, that you can watch, and there are texts to download in between each. And of course, it's a wonderful depiction of uh, Shalom Aleichem's writing and what he was doing, and why he was relevant then, and why in some ways he's even more relevant now. Uh, but one of the things that she discusses is her own distaste for Fiddler on the Roof. But the original stage play in the 60s, the film, the different uh, iterations that the play has had, because there was this need to Americanize Tevya in, in the film. You know, there's so many essential differences, not the least of which is that the film and the play depict three daughters. I mean, there are other daughters, but they have no action. But they're the three daughters. Right? Uh, uh, but in fact, in the, in the book, there are the stories of five daughters, and the daughters who aren't depicted in in the film have a much more tragic end than the three who are, and it gives a much fuller picture of what happens to, to Tevya. And there are so many uh, differences. Of course, uh, of course, uh, Huddle who ends up marrying the, the Russian, uh, converting, going off to the going off to the um, to the monastery uh, to convert. Uh, in the end, she comes back to, to Tevya. That's quite different in the in the source material. And it says a lot about how intermarriage was thought of and depicted in the United States in the in the mid '60s, and and what Shalom Aleichem thought about. Anyway, I mention all this by way of saying you owe it to yourselves if you've if you've gained something from from our sessions together. You owe it to yourselves to go and 
read read uh, Tevni on his own or read of any of Shalom Aleichem on his own. So much of Shalom Aleichem has been translated in multiple translations. Uh, some better, some some better yet. Um, Hillel Halkin's translations are really quite fine. The translations of Kurt Leviant are also very good. He did uh, quite a bit of Agnon translation uh, as well. If you want to read Tevya, read Hillel Halkin's translation of the Tevya's Tevya the, the Dairyman, uh, published by published by Shokin. But I wanted to talk a bit about the depiction of the depiction of childhood in in uh, in Shalom Aleichem and in in Agnon. When Shalom Aleichem starts writing. He's already in the second generation, maybe even third generation, of you know modern Yiddish writers influenced by the Haskalah, by the Jewish Enlightenment. When Mendele, who Agnon had called the Zaydi, the the grandfather of Yiddish literature, when he begins writing, everything in the program of the Haskalah opposed the depiction of the fantastic, of the of the wondrous, of folklore. Jewish folklore was seen as the repository of a kind of old world way of looking at things. It was the it was the uh, kind of corruption of the midrashic tendencies in Jewish imagination. And it was the purview of which group, which Jewish group? Hasidim. Right? Hasidim had taken Jewish folklore and turned it into the very object of Jewish study. You understand that the Hasidic tale was not just a kind of uh, storytelling mechanism. It was a way of conveying Jewish thought. It was a way of the Rebbe sitting at the at the tish, Shamshidis, and saying over a Torah, saying over a teaching. Chaim the shoemaker, and Shmerel the butcher, and Feivel the, the the water drawer, and Yankel the 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 wood chopper. Simple downtrodden Jews who were not holding by the dafyomi. Who could not have appreciated great chakiras and lumdas and Talmudic discourses, and it was a way of conveying the essence of Jewish messages and Jewish spirituality in folklore. So that Hasidim themselves become the principal object of satire of the early writings of the of the Maskili. And there's this move away from anything that smacks of fantasy, of superstition, of folk customs, to depict a kind of realistic. And if it had to be depicted in a in, in early Yiddish literature, if it had to be depicted in some kind of historical setting aside from the present, they hearkened back to biblical times. If you know, some of you live in town, you know there's that little street, Rehov Mapu, right? No, Mapu is, uh, he's not so known, he's not so read. Mapu was the first Hebrew, he was the first modern Hebrew author. He writes was considered the first modern, of course, he would be the first modern Hebrew author. Moshe is the first modern Hebrew author, right? But then he's the first to write a modern novel in this newly reawokened or revived Hebrew language. And his novels, oh, we saw him when we were in... Uh, in Kovno, in Kovno this summer, right? We saw there's the statue to Mapu. Uh, he came from he came, Avram Mapu. He came from Kovno. And there's that little street between King Solomon and King and King David, uh, next to the Mariah. I, I, you know, I'm an old timer, right? You know, old timer is not how old you are; it's how long you've been in Israel. So I still call it I still call it the Mariah Hotel. But what what is it? The Dan Panorama. But I, you know what? I still I still call I still call it the La Rome, right? I can't get I can't get used to these newfangled things. It used to be the La Rome when I came in when I I know today it's the Inbal, but I'm an old timer. I'm an old Jewish Shalmi. I, I'm here over twenty five years. I can't get used to these newfangled things. So I still call it the La Rome. My my kids have no idea what I'm talking about. So uh anyway, 
Uh, so Mapu, uh, we, we got off track, you understand. Rehov Mapu after Mapu. Mapu sets his novels in the biblical period, which is considered this kind of heyday for the, for the masculine, before rabbinic Judaism had come and corrupted the, the Jewish enterprise. So there's this kind of emphasis on realism, so much so that when Mendel, perhaps Mendel is among his best-known works, is a short novel called, in Yiddish it's called The Kleitsche. The, the, in English it's, called, it's translated as The Nag, meaning the female horse, not, not the wife who nags, right? A nag. Uh, uh, in Hebrew it's called Susati, my horse. And it's a kind of anthropomorphized horse who's an allegory, in other words, it's, it's, a, it's a sentient horse. We, the reader, know what the horse is, is thinking. Um, but even given that kind of fantastic reality, magical realism of, of knowing what, you know, this was a device, of course, that Agnon used left, right, and center, uh, Balak the dog and uh, so, many other, so many other animals that we, that we are uh, privy to their, to their thoughts. So in Mendel's work, the allegory is so apparent that the horse, this kind of downtrodden, beaten, broken down old nag, is an allegory for the Jewish people, that it doesn't break the realism of the work. It's not, it's not fantasy. It's not folklore. When, when, um, when Shalom Aleichem comes along, he has to find a way back. We were just watching the the scene of, uh, which is actually taken pretty, pretty straight out of the book, the scene where Tevya has to convince Golde that 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 the daughter should marry Lezu of the butcher. We should break that shidduch, and she we should allow her to marry the tailor of Muttel Kemzoil. So what does he do? He concocts this dream where Grandma Seitel comes back from the grave to warn him what will happen, and then comes from a Sarah, the, the widow, the dead wife of the butcher, who's going to kill Cycle if, if she marry, comes. Who, uh, how, how can you allow her to take my place to wear my pearls, my keys? <laughs> right? And, and, and gold is a, you know, even, even there in the source material and even in the film, we know, we the viewer and we the reader know, there is no ghost. It's not depicted as real, even though it's filmed. Oh boy, what do we see on the film? We see how Gold imagines it. But we know, we see before he wakes her up. We know that Tevya has crafted this whole bubble mice from whole cloth in order to scare Gold into agreeing to cancel the Shidduch with Laser Wolf. Right? But it's not depicted as real. It's not depicted as if there, the ghost really did come or that they experienced it as real. Even Golda doesn't experience it as real. It's just so vivid to her when he's telling her the story, she imagines it, but it's depicted completely that Golda wouldn't have believed it. Golda has no doubt that Grandma Title came back from the other world, and if my grandmother Title came back from the other world, all I can say is that it's a sign, and it couldn't be any better. Amen, poo-poo, right? So that, that kind of fantasy is still has to be held at arm's length. It can't be depicted as if as if it actually happened. Right? We have to know that the whole thing was above a mice crafted to to trick a gullible a gullible golden. But Shalom Aleichem discovered a way into the fantastic, into recovering or recuperating uh, Jewish folklore. And that was through the prism of the child. Because if you depict the story from the child's point of view, to a child, everything is magical. Everything is fantastical. Everything is wondrous. And you can tell the story, you can recapture that, the potency of what was lost. If he understood that the Haskalah's agenda meant abandoning a form of storytelling which had actually been a quite successful tool in the toolkit of authors, you know, probably from the time that people were painting on cave walls. And he had to recuperate it, he had to resurrect it, and he could only do that through the eye of the, the, eye of the child. This is an idea that was, that was most, most uh, cogently uh, explained 
in the scholarship of Professor David Roskies of, uh, of the JTS in New York, who writes that uh, Hebrew literature uh, or Jew Jewish literature allowed for a recreated but safely distanced world of fantasy. All one needed was to conjure up the experience of a child for whom presumably marvelous things were an everyday occurrence. Shalom Aleichem's talent for telling stories of children. Well, here's the question. You, you may have read, I mean, some of you did your homework. Uh, some people complained about these, about these stories because they're, they're hard. They're, they, they don't end necessarily happily ever after. Um, uh, are these children's stories or are these stories about children? That's an interesting question. It's an interesting question when we come to Agdon, who wrote even fewer stories that could be depicted either as children's stories or stories about about children, uh, less far less than than Shalom Aleichem. In Shalom Aleichem's collected writings, there's a whole large section, quite a few hundred pages of in Hebrew. It's called it's called Masiot uh, Lialdei Israel. I forget how it's called in Yiddish, but Sipur Masiot. Mises from how is Jewish children? Uh, Yiddish I don't know. I don't know how it's called in Yiddish, but probably something like that. Um, and these are these are presented as you can even see on the on the cover of the book. There's a little hingle with his tate, right? Uh, uh, on the back is on the back is uh, Shalom Aleichem. Um, uh, there's certainly stories about children. And certainly later, Shalom Aleichem develops the kind of theme of Vatsuras von Kinder, right? Tsar Gidel Bonim, right? The trouble of, uh, of and, and, and no doubt, uh, Fiddler is, uh, each of the chapters of Fiddler, of, 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 Fiddler, of Tevya, right, uh, depict Tsuras von Kinder of one kind or another. And as a matter of fact, it's a kind of descending, e with each progressive shidduch, the situation gets worse and worse. I mean, when we start off at the Shande, right? Uh, when Motel says he wants to marry, marry a title, Tevye can't believe it. He says, what? Are you also going to be, you're going to be the bride and the groom and the rabbi standing under the hook all at once? Who ever heard of something so ridiculous? Uh, a man arranging his own match. Right? This is the role of the Tate. Tradition. And then it gets only downhill from there. The, the, the use of the child's point of view, the use of the child's point of view in telling stories allowed space to create an ironic gap. Because we are told the story from the child's point of view, but we are not children. Neither necessarily is the narrator. Sometimes you sense is an adult telling a story, and sometimes we're meant to believe, as is the case in almost every situation with Agdon, we're meant to believe that there's an autobiographical telling of a story here. In some cases, Shalom Aleichem made the claim that, that some of these stories were indeed autobiographical mem mem memories of his own childhood. Who's to say whether that's true or not? But it's, it's an adult telling a story of something that happened to him as a child, but once the story gets going, the narrator really is the child. It's no longer the, the adult. And at the end, there's a gap between how the child understood the experience that he had, and it's almost always a he, and how we, the reader, experience, how we, the reader, understand the, the, the experience that we had. And that creates this space for an ironic awareness, this, this kind of gap. Salma Aleichem's first, you know, kind of, masterpiece, like his first, an early story for which he really got a tremendous amount of attention was a short story called Dos Meso, the pen knife. And it becomes an object which uh, re repeats and reappears in lots of other stories. It's a story which first published in Yiddish in 1886. It's available, by the way, I had given you translations of two stories. Uh, but then afterwards, I discovered superior translations to what I sent you out. So if you'd like, if you'd like uh, the better translations, or if you'd like a copy of this uh, story, The Penknife, in translation, you can email me and I'll be happy to, to send them to you. Um, uh, 
including the fact that, that one of the stories that I gave you, the Esrog story, what I gave you is an abridged form of the story. The, the original is, is longer. It's an interesting question to look at the differences between the translations from the Yiddish to the Hebrew, from the Yiddish to the English. Every translator did different adaptations for, for different re reasons, sometimes abridging the story. So in, in the penknife, which is, again, presented as a piece of autobiography, a poor boy fantasizes about a penknife. Now, uh, probably lots of little boys fantasize about this. I remember when I was a kid uh, going off to the Cub Scouts, and you got a, you got a, as part of your kit, you got like a little penknife. And it's, it, well, it's like exciting. You know, the idea that you're trusted with this, I mean, this dangerous, this dangerous device. And only very recently, it was my, my birthday last year, a friend of mine, because I was admiring his, uh, gave me a little, this little pen knife, little pocket knife. It's tiny. It's, it's about only two inches long. But I can't tell you how much joy it brings me. I put it in my pocket in the morning. It's so darn handy, right? That it's, just, it's, it's handy to have a, a little a little pocket knife in your in your in your pocket. So you're a little boy and you get a, you get a little pocket knife like this. It's well, it's it's like excited. It's like a sign that you're like a you're, I don't know. You're like a little man. You're a little man, right? So the boy has this fantasy of, of somehow acquiring, acquiring a penknife. So what does he do? He, he breaks into the pushke, the charity box in Heider, in, in school, and he takes out money to buy it, and he buys himself a penknife. The next day, when uh, some poor still child is mistakenly blamed and beaten cruelly uh, by the Rebbe in Heider, so this little boy falls into this kind of racked with, with guilt, uh, but of course he doesn't fess up, uh, and because he sees what happened, if he saw what happened to the kid who, who was taka innocent, you know what's the world left to him. It's of course uh, an opportunity to depict the horrors of the Heider when you know you can get whacked for you know for anything, right? So, Maybe there's somebody in this room who remembers the days when teachers could give you a whack. Right? The nuns in Catholic school? The nuns in Catholic school? Yeah. They hit hard. Right? Back in the back in the sixties when you were in elementary school. Eighteen sixties. <laughs> Stories from eighteen eighty six. Uh so Ah well, well, well. You see it. You, we see it, it's a theme that's going to repeat. It's a theme that's going to repeat in the stories for in the stories for tonight. And the ending, the end of the story. The kid is sick. He's he's almost dead, or at least that's how he depicts it. And when he's miraculously recovered, and it's depicted as a as a miracle, almost divine intervention. He's learned his lesson, and he'll never lie again. I cannot, you know, like George Rush. I cannot tell a lie. But here's the here's the rub. Well, he, he does keep the knife. But in other words, how many kids get caught doing something naughty? And, no, no, no. Correct. But he's caught in the sense that he knows he's done something wrong, right? Now, how many how many kids do something wrong? And whether they get caught or they don't get caught, but they know that he sees the punishment that should have been his on the person of the innocent child falsely accused, and he vows, he's learned his lesson, he'll never lie again. So if you're a kid and you're reading the story, what message do you take away from it? Well, in other words, it's ambivalent. One is, if you lie, you might get away with it. The other is, if you do something wrong, there's a punishment out there. Now, maybe in this case, the punishment, he, he got, got away by the, by the skin, of his, skin of his teeth. But he's learned his lesson not to lie. But does the adult reader actually believe that this kid who has the goods in his pocket is never going to lie again? That's the ironic gap between what the child depicts as the moral of the story and what the adult reader might suspect is not the end of the end of the story. Uh, Roski's again uh, points to this recuperating of the idea of myth and what for Shalom Aleichem, what does myth, 
what does miss come to mean? So on one hand, it's the belief system of the Jewish people. It's the stories they actually lived with. It's the structure of how they perceive reality. And in a lot of cases, like the two stories for today, that, uh, that revolves around the Jewish holidays, that revolves around the weekly Torah portion. Interestingly, very little depiction of Shabbat in Shalom Aleichem. Shalom Aleichem's son, uh, now of course, you know, Shalom Aleichem himself was not a ritually observant Jew, and the, the gap between Judaism as depicted in his stories, and Judaism has actually lived in his own, in his own home. You know, at home, he, he spoke and wrote and corresponded with his children, not in Yiddish, but in Russian, because Russian was the language of, you know, upwardly mobile, acculturating Jews who had some kind of hope uh, that, you know, we will become accepted here in this empire of, of ours. But Shabbat Berkowitz, Shalom Aleichem, son-in-law, says that the Shalom Aleichem had this kind of antipathy towards Shabbat, like his memories of it from childhood were probably just days of endless boredom, you know, and a kind of maze of restrictions, often fear that children today still experience Shabbat with, uh, with some of that. But for Shalom Aleichem, the, the Jewish world becomes the source of the Jewish myth that can be recuperated. It's so that, so that on, on Jewish holidays and Yontif, reading stories about Yontif, like reading a story about the Pastora flag or about the Esrog or about the Matzah or Tubishvat or, or Purim or what have you, becomes in and itself, the reading of the story becomes a form of observance of the holiday. Maybe even it's a holiday whose other observances have fallen by the wayside. And of course, very many of Shalom Aleichem's stories, Shalom Aleichem always had this kind of perpetual uh, financial pressure. Right? He really, it really was a case of publish or perish. Right? Because he earned his living as a, as a writer, and he was always making money and losing money and investing in the stock market and going bust. So he had to keep, he just had this, kind of renewable resource, which was the ability to keep writing more. And, uh, you know, newspapers wanted, we were coming up on Pesach, newspapers wanted a story for Pesach. We were coming up on Rosh Hashanah, newspapers wanted a story for Rosh Hashanah. So these stories are, you know, take up a certain, a certain quantity of his collected writings. But even in the novels, the depiction of the Jewish holidays, right, the writing about it, sometimes it's more about it than it itself, and he was writing for audiences in, in Europe and also in Yiddish reading audiences in the United States for whom there was this distancing from ritual itself, but not from feeling connected to the rituals that they were no longer observing. And you could observe the rituals in absentia by reading a Shalom Aleichem. So you'd get the, you'd get the Yiddish forward on Erev Yantif, and there'd be a Shalom Aleichem story, and you'd read that instead of, you'd read a story about going to shul on Yom Kippur, perhaps, instead of actually going to shul on Yom, on Yom Kippur. On the other hand, Rosky points out, and so in the first case, the myth itself, the story, myth, the mythologist, mythologist, Jason, let me try this, mythologizing, mythologizatia, the mythologizing of Jewish life becomes a source of hope, of continuity, and of transcendence. It's a way to connect to Jewish spirituality. On the other hand, myth is, a, is the kind of deep structure of Jewish experience. It's the archetypical plot of, of the story of Jewish life and, and Jewish history which are embedded in, in Jewish life itself. And that includes a lot of things that are less joyous than, than holidays. And therefore, sometimes the myth depicts failure and fate and the kind of inescapable question mark that's out there for what happens to the Jewish people. So it's a kind of a two-edged penknife. On one hand, it's transcendence, and on the other, it's the kind of inescapable 
face, fake, fake, fake. Another story, the story that I, I gave out to you, is the Simcha Torah. And the, the story is called The Flag or Defon. It's from 1900. It's the story of the Simcha Torah. So you know what the Simcha Torah flags are. It's by the cardboard flags. It's interesting. The National Library, you know, where they collect everything. You know, like, you know, it's Pashkevilimar. Uh, those of you outside of Israel may be less familiar, but you know there are these signs, these broadsheet signs that they that they that they um, paste up onto onto the walls and onto the boards, announcing this and that and the other thing. People die, and there's an event, and there's a, or, or denouncing uh, all types of things. So the Pashkivim, so the, you know, the National Library collects all the Pashkivim, right? Because one day people are going to write doctoral dissertations on the Pashkivim. Right? And they call it as a collection of Simchas Torah flags. And it's like fascinating. So this you really could write a, a doctoral dissertation because the, what you put on your Simchas Torah flag for your kid says something about what you. So here's a Simchas Torah flag. Wait, right? this must be a Zionish uh, Simchas Torah flag. First of all, it's modeled after the Degel Yisrael. Right? You see, you see, you see, here's the Magen David. And here's the blue and white stripes. And here you have boys and girls dancing together, although, to be clear, the girls are not yet dancing with the Sefer Torah, only the boys. But in short pants, right? In the kippah suga, whatever that is, short skirts, not so tzanua, don't look at it, right? Here's, here's a, a more, uh, a more uh, pious-looking one. Zoysa Torah, Shesam, Moshe, if they b'nei Israel, right? Ba'ad Amenu, Artenu, Vitoratenu. I don't know whose slogan that was, but it's not so Haredi. It's a Zionist. It's a Zionist flag. It's on behalf of our nation and our land and our Torah. Right? It's some kind of religious Zionist flag. Zion. Zion. Here's one from Kovno from the early 20th century. You have, you have these, these archetypical pictures of Moshe Rabbeinu with the Karne Hod, with the with the uh, with the rays of light, Aaron Cohen, right? The two lions, the thing. Here's right. There's no girls on this one, that's for sure, right? This is from the first decade of the 20th century. And in the flag, Shalom Leichem describes again. It's a it's a poor, poverty-stricken boy whose aspiration is to have a Simchas Torah flag. Now, Agdon also does this. Agdon has a whole series of very short, they're almost, they're just vignettes, where he takes some kind of object, a ritual object or a household object, and he crafts a story around it. He's got a short story about his sidur that one time his father brought back from the fair. His father would go off to the fair. This is the story we'll see at the end of the evening about the kerchief. His father goes off to the fair and would bring back all types of wonders. Once he brought him a little sidur, and the sidur was one of these, you know, like today we have a sidur like this. It's like the sidur is every tefillah, and even the tefillah you don't say, right? Everything is in there. And how the sidur itself was kind of like the, the uh, cycle of the year. And all you have to do is turn the pages, and suddenly you're transported to Purim, and then you turn the pages, and you're transported to Hanukkah, and then you turn the pages, and you're transported to Pesach, and... Sukkot, etc. He's got another lovely little little depiction of Shas Shel Beit Zikni, my grandfather's Talmud. Describes his grandfather had, you know, in the days, and, and again, this is an essential difference between childhood is depicted in Shalom Aleichem versus in Agdon, and the actual biographical childhoods of the two. Shalom Aleichem grows up pretty much in poverty, has not does not have a particularly happy childhood. I told you in our first session that you know his very first piece of writing is this catalog of his stepmother's curses. And uh, Agnon grows up, you know, it's like almost out of central casting that he has this wicked stepmother. Agnon grows up the eldest of five children in a rather well-to-do family, and he was spoiled. He was everybody, you know, his grandparents and his parents and his siblings. Everybody thought he was just the greatest thing ever. He, the sun and the moon and the stars in between all circled around him. And from a young age, he's recognized as being a genius and talented. And he's every 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 uh, every whim he wants is 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 uh, his wishes. Everyone's command. And he has a rather uh, a rather happy childhood, and that comes through in in his writing. Um, but in the Simchas Torah 
flag. The child, his name is Koppel. You know, Koppel is a Yiddish nickname for Yaakov, for Jacob. But he's got a speech impediment or a stutter or something. So he can't say the K in the, in the better translation that I didn't have ready for you, but which I'm happy to send to you. This is depicted more artfully. So he, when asked his name, he can't say Koppel. He says Koppel. Right, and the whole story, all of his, all of his dialogue is depicted with this, with this speech deficiency. So he's this poor, stuttering boy. He's beaten and teased, you know, by all, and he somehow managed to earn forty-four kopecks. It was like forty-four pennies. For on Purim, he was now old enough to be a delivery boy for the shlachminus. His father is the gabai, or his father is like the, the. Deputy Gabbai in the basement minion of the butcher's shtibble, right? It's like very low down on the totem pole. Totem pole. And since his father, part of his father's job is to organize the delivery of the shlachmanos, so he farms it out to the boy to be this delivery boy. So all the poor him, he spent running around delivering the shlachminas. So he gets, he probably gets like a tip or something, a chatsi kopek from everyone. So he had 44 kopek, which for him, which for him is like a fortune. It's a, it's a king's ransom. And his Yetzirah and Yetzirah Tov, like remember in Bugs Bunny or Daffy Duck, the devil and the angel would like sit on Daffy's shoulders, you know, like the, the devil and angel are it's Daffy in a devil costume and Daffy in an angel costume, whispering to his ear what they're arguing, what to do. So the Yetzirah Tov, the, the evil inclination and the good inclination are arguing, what should he do with the 44, the 44 kopex? Uh, should he, uh, the Yetzer, the, the Yetzer, uh, the Yetzer Hara says to him, go, quick, run, buy a poppy seed cake. You know, like this treat that he can't ever, ever have, he can't ever imagine. And the Yetzer are told, the good English says, no, no, go run and give the money to Mama, because, you know, she doesn't have two kopecks to, to rub together to manage the house. And, you know, you should give it to your mother. And he says, my, my mother, I mean. Like, I'll never see the money again. She'll never pay me back. Right? And the evil inclination says, go, you know, with 44 kopecks, you could even buy a pen knife. Right? The pen knife remains, it's, it's, it's all those years later, it still remains this potent symbol of the childhood's, you know, object and desire. Right? You could buy a pen knife. And the good inclination says, go, you could go get, you could give it to Tzedakah. So he says, listen to me, says the, the good inclination. Distribute the money among the poor. Give it to charity. You'll get credit for pious deeds. Some of the paupers are starving, those poor souls. Paupers? The evil inclination turns to me. You yourself are a pauper's son. You yourself are always hungry. Everybody's always generous with the next fellow's cash. Why didn't anyone ever give you anything when you were broke? So what does he do? He uses most of the money to finance from, from Purim until Simchas Torah. It's a long time. It's like seven months. He saves the money, and most of it he uses to finance his Simchas Torah flag. In those days, owning a flag, this is, this is the source you see on the sheet. In those days, owning a flag for Simchas Torah, I mean a flag in the full sense of the word, a lit candle in an apple, and the apple on the flag was such bliss, such joy, I hardly dared dream about it. There were other treats aplenty to dream about. Why, there were some boys in school who had money for pen knives, purses, and little canes. There were those who ate candy and cracked nuts every single day, not to mention bagels and pancakes. My goodness, there were even those who ate white loaf not only on Shabbat, but even on weekdays as well. What luck. Oh, children, I've never, ever tasted white loaf on weekdays. I was happy if I had my full of black bread, for we were... God spare you such a bitter lot, a bunch of impoverished paupers, despite the fact that everyone in the family worked his fingers to the bone. On the night of Shemini Atzeris, I attached the flag to the stick, stuck a red apple on the tip, put a lit candle atop the apple, and then set out for the synagogue for the Torah, for the Hakafot, for the Hakafot, right? The dancing around with the Torah on Simba's Torah night. I was in high spirits, feeling like a happy prince, an incomparable child of royalty. I imagined that I was already in the synagogue, sitting next to the eastern wall with all the rich children. But if I were rich, right, I'd have the time, then I'd, and sit by the eastern wall. 
The lights were kindled. My flag was the most beautiful. My apple redder than all the rest. My candle the biggest of all. Now, here's, does anybody remember having such a flag with the apple? With the so now, you know, they still have the flags, but you never see today, kids. First of all, because somebody, you know, it's like, you think about it. When I was a kid, I remember my mother saying, when I was a kid, you know, we came up from the hospital, there was, a, you know, the baby carrier, you know, which was basically like a box with handles. And you put it on the back seat of the station. <laughs> and, then of course, and no belts. This is, right, I remember my mother had this big red station wagon. Right, and you turn the corner, and your baby is like, you know, like a, right. So, so I guess somebody figured out it's not the smartest thing in the world to let a bunch of six-year-olds run around with lit fire on Simcha Torah. So, yeah. So, but you had you had the you had either the candy apple, either an apple or a candy apple on top of the flag with it with it with it with a with a flame. You had this. So, so today, so today, I think they give out in the shul they give out candy apples, but there's no fire. We have fire, we don't jelly apples. Okay, but this is what it looked like. So, Simchas Torah night, there was this kid. There was the, like the bully in class was a kid named Yulik. He was rich. When he heard that that Popel had forty four kopecks in his pocket all those months. Tried to get it from him. He kept telling him, he kept telling him, uh, you know, if you give me your 40 kopecks, I'll trade you something for it. I'll give you, you see, my, my pen knife? And his pen knife was the pride because he, he, he was a rich kid, so he had a pen knife. He said, I'll give you my pen knife for your 44 kopecks. But Topol is not an idiot. He says, for 44 kopecks, I can buy my own pen knife. And it'll be brand new instead of your used one. So he says, so, so you look, says, well, what about buttons? I'll give you buttons. And, you know, buttons, you can you keep buttons in your pocket. They jingle and jangle around people. They get money in your pocket. He says, I have money in my pocket. I have 44 kopecks in my pocket. So he says, I'll give you nuts. He says, nuts? You have for 44 kopecks? I can buy a thousand walnuts. A nail. I have a nail. It sounds like, you know, it sounds like, now, you, you remember the story when, 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 did I tell the story here? When Shalom Aleichem arrives in New York, no less a figure than Mark Twain comes to greet him. And, and Shalom Aleichem says, it's an honor to meet you, Mr. Twain. You know, they say that I am the, the, the Jewish Mark Twain. And, and Mark Twain replied, that's funny. I've heard that I am the American Shalom Aleichem. But there is something to be said about the humor between them. And, of course, there was no keener observer than American childhood than, than Twain. But that idea that, uh, that Tom Sawyer tries to get the kids to, you know, he has to whitewash the, the fence. And the fence It's a hot summer day, and as his punishment, uh, he has to whitewash the fence. And he's looking at it, and it looks as broad as the continent of Africa. So what does he do? He convinces the other kids in the neighborhood there's no greater joy than whitewashing a fence. Oh, my goodness, how lucky I am to whitewash the fence. As a matter of fact, you know, a lot of kids would pay a nickel to whitewash the fence. I'll let you do it for just three pennies, right? Until he gets it, every kid in the neighborhood whitewashing the fence for him. So the Ulex has a little, except that our tuple is a little too, is a little too, too clever, All right? So on Simchas Torah night, come on, let me have a look, Rich Ulick said in amazement as he stood next to me. Let me have a look at, at your flag. He examined my flag. I examined his. There's a flag for you, I thought. Some stick bent like a bagel. I saw that he was furious. In other words, Topol has managed, poor Topol has managed to get a superior flag than Rich Ulick has. This is bent like a bagel. I saw he was furious, but I pretended not to notice and busily studied my shoelaces. Coppoli said, where did you get such a fine stick? What did you say? I asked, looking up. Where did you find such a cute little stick? Why do you ask? I said. Want to swap it for your nail? But uh, you look and said, well, if, if for 40, 40 kopecks, I'll give you this, this, this nail. So, so Coppoli said, what am I going to do with this? Is that a nail? You know what a nail is good for? A nail, you can bang it into anything you want. So, so now the joke's on him. That is finally, what, what has, what has Puppel acquired with his kopecks? An 
and his and his Acme A1 Spatara flag. Status, superiority, self-respect for the one first time and only time in his life, he's not the bottom of the totem pole. He's not the stuttering son of a pauper shamus, right, who gets beat on and made fun of. The object of everyone's blows on the on the schoolyard, on the in the in the chaser of the cheder, but he, he's gone too far. When I was a kid, I you know I was I was more like couple. I was this little bookish kid, nerdy, and there was this one kid on the block. He was a real bully. He was like a real, like really out of central casting, like a real. What'd you say? Oh, I thought you were gonna say a real goy. But he was like a boy should come too. But what? He had arms like Popeye. Right? I remember once we were on the schoolyard and he was teasing the other kids. And honest to God, if I had one wish, it would be to remember what my smart alecky remark was. But I had a really good smart alecky remark. And, and everybody laughed at him. And you know what he did? He punched me right in the mouth. And like on the cartoons, I saw stars and Tweety Bird. <laughs> I ran home crying. I'm going to tell my mother. I ran home crying. I told my mother. And you know what she said? What's your good lesson? Don't be such a smart ass. <laughs> and you know what? Okay, it's a good lesson. <laughs> so, so here, says, where would you find such a cute little stick? Why do you ask? You see, you see how he depicts it? Why do you ask? Because you can't say K. Okay. Why do you ask? I said. Want to swap it for your nail? You look, got the dig. Eyes gleaming, he sniffed, put his hands into his pockets, and went away. I watched him, beaming with ever-increasing joy. He called Nehemia. Nehemia is a lame boy, also a poor kid. But you know what a rich kid can do with a poor kid? He can easily manipulate him. I'll be your best friend. I'll be your best friend if... Right? If this happens, we have... We have I mean, we have, thank God, a bunch of kids. Each kid, as they get older, was once young. Do you see? There's more with the girls than with the boys. But this whole thing about who's your best friend, and I'm not talking to this one anymore, and I'm not talking to that one anymore, and I'm never going to this girl's house, and that girl's having a birthday party, we're not going with it. Right? So, Yulik says to Nehemiah, he drafts Nehemiah. And Nehemiah, if Yulik will just look at him, you know, he'll do anything. He whispered something to him and winked in my direction. I noticed this, but pretended not to. A moment later, Nehemiah limped up to me, holding Yulik's flag with the bent stick. Give me a light, he said. Mine went out. This isn't your flag, is it? I asked, holding the candle to his. You can't fool me. I know very well whose flag it is. But before I had a chance to blink, Nehemiah touched his lit candle to my flag and gave the light right back to me. My flag flamed, sputtered, and no more flag. I had a stone fallen from the sky and struck my head. I had a wild beast attempted to devour me. I had a corpse dressed in a tattered shroud sought to choke me. My fright would not have been as great as it was when I saw my naked stick and my burnt out flag. From deep down within me I cried, Woe is me, my flag, my flag, my flag. I burst into tears. Everything became dark. The stick, the apple, the candle fell from my hands and I began to wander about aimlessly. I walked on without direction the hot and bitter tears streaming out of my eyes. But there's a, there's a kind of epilogue to the story. And in the epilogue, the adult narrator now kind of breaks the fourth wall, and he addresses his audience, who he presumes are children. Kinder, you know that all stories either have a happy, sad, or either have... Sorry. Kinder, you know that all stories either have sad or happy endings. For the most part, Jewish stories have sad endings. According to one of our proverbs, a Jew, especially a poor one, is not destined to have pleasure. Much can be said about this. When you grow up, you'll understand. But meanwhile, I must tell you that the story you just heard did not end just there. The flag caused me much anguish, and I took sick, and then he describes how burning fevers and nightmares took hold of him. They thought he was at one foot in the grave. But since today is the eve of the holiday. And a holiday, especially on Simple Torah, we have to be merry and gay. I'd like to end the story of my flag on a happy note. Now, as apparently the story was first published in the Yiddish newspaper for Sukkot, for Simple Torah. So you can't leave a story like this. I mean, you know, people won't want to buy the next story. 
So he has to add, and one wonders if it, it wasn't some editor that kind of goaded him into doing this. He has to add this epilogue. And he tells him, first of all, thank heaven I recovered from the illness that set upon me after this episode. But second, for your information, the following year my flag was even my stick more beautiful, my apple redder. In fact, I sat way up by the eastern wall with all the other rich men's children. The lights burned, my flag sparkled, Jews danced around the synagogue with the Torah, Reb Melech the cantor, his palace outspread, led the procession like a field marshal. His voice quavered as he sang out, Ana Hashem Hoshiano! An endless stream of women and girls pressed forward to kiss the Torah and shrilled to his face. Live and be well till next year at this time. And Reb Melech responded, The same to you and yours, dear children, Tyra Kinder, the same to you and yours. But do we believe it? In other words, maybe we do, maybe we don't. But it's, but it's a little... What happened in the intervening year, that little topple? Well, in other words, the question of what do you learn from the story is, is not a fair one. As, well, as I've told you many times, uh, neither Agno nor Shomalek, nor any author sets out to be... Uh, there's no... It's a, it's, it's a depiction of life as he experienced it. But this idea, this, well, well it's, it's, it's a harsh indictment of the class system. It's a harsh indictment even of how children from the earliest age immediately imbibe those inequalities and know how the power flows so that a little Yulik knows that he has control over Topol and the Chemia and, and the rest. In other words, the question is like, what's the didactic? This is not a Hasidic tale. That's exactly the point. A Hasidic tale is meant to instruct you, to inspire you, to more. There's not, there's, this is not Aesop's fable that ends with the moral of the story. Right? It's, 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 in other words, his, his, whether it makes you feel happy or sad, I see a tear in your eyes. Right? Right? No, but in other words, whether, whether it makes you happy or sad, the, the, the artistic impulse here is, is aesthetic. Right? To cause it's exactly what's happening right now. You're feeling emotion by having read it, and it happens to be a negative emotion, but that doesn't matter. Right? You're feeling emotion. Here's a story that's written 120 years ago. <laughs> this one's written something. And, and it has that power to uh, affect, affect us on that level. Uh, a later story from two years later, the, the, the Esrog, the Esrog, uh, is a theme that, you know, exists in so many different iterations, including in Hasidic tales. And of course, you may know the Agnonian version of 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 the Esrog, uh, who, who who has something similar. And there's this question of like the misery that's caused. And does misery love company, or is is, is misery a is, is misery a zero sum game? In other words. In the in the in the pen knife, when the innocent child is beaten instead of instead of the actual thief, it's not that there's like a quantity of misery. Now, having been visited on the innocent child, the thief is spared. No, there's a greater quantity of misery in the world, but the innocent child is miserable because he's been beaten, and the guilty child is miserable because he bears the guilt, although not the whip. In the Esrug, which is, you know, it's almost, it's so, it's so, um, it's almost so predictable, you know, the story. The story almost writes itself and presumably did at the pen of many different authors. But again, it's a poor family. <laughs> I remember, and I'm a little younger than some of the people here. I remember when I was a kid growing up in suburban New Jersey, not everyone had their own little of an Esrug, right? The... Shumakim had the series the Holy Rollers. I grew up in one of those kinds of Orthodox schools that that don't exist anymore. Uh, rabbi Stephen Dworkin, that was the rabbi. It was an Orthodox school with a largely non-Orthodox uh, population. People drove. Don't ask, don't tell. You drove. You parked around the corner. You know, you you could tell the people whose 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 yarmulkes had that crease in them. You know, from having been in the pocket, you take it and then it would kind of like rest on your it would, it would rest on your head like that because you couldn't get the crease out of exactly right. So, uh, but not everybody had a you know lulav and Few people did, 
And the shul had a few sets of Lulav and Esrug that they had an abimah. People took it. They either knew the halachot of lachem and it having to be yours on the first day, or we didn't go into all of that. Again, don't ask. Don't tell. But certainly, in the shtetl, in Kasulevka, is depicted in Shalom Aleichem, only the wealthy could afford their own Lulav and Esrug. And indeed, Lulav and Esrug were much more expensive, you know, adjusted for inflation, than they are today, where you can get a little bit of Esrug in every, I mean, you can get a little bit of Esrug in vending machines in, in, in the gas station. You can buy them in every Rami Levy. You can, I mean, it's, it's Mashiach Tzayt. You go into Rami Levy today, you go into the supermarket today, you get your little bit of Esrug, you, get your, you can get your Shmura Matzah before Pesach, and now for Daf Yomi, they're selling Gemaras in Rami Levy. You know, next, you know like in, in America, they also Rami Levy, also in the Daf Yomi supermarket. Uh, you know, it's like in America, you go into the supermarket, and at the checkout, like to tempt you, there's People Magazine, right? Because, well, okay, people, I want to know what's happening with this celebrity and that celebrity, who's dating who and whatever. Here you go to the supermarket, you know what this is, the second brachot, you know, start now, daf yomi. So now you can get a little bit of sugar everywhere, and it's not so expensive. And then you can get, I, I mean, I, I, for my children, for the time that they were old enough to take little bit of I bought them lulav and esrug. It's not prohibitively expensive. I mean, my, not when they were bar mitzvah, when they were young. I said to them, if you're prepared to come to shul every day, my boys, my girls also, I said, if you're prepared to come to shul every day at Chalamoid and take lulav and esrug and shul, as if you're not going to, so then you can use, you can use my lulav at home. But if you want to come to shul and do lulav and esrug and walk around the hakafos, I'll buy you lulav and esrug. It's not that expensive. But that was not the case here. So the little boy hears from his father, I'm picking up in the middle of the story here, that this year, Father said, this year we're going to buy an Esrik, my father declared. The Esrik was always the most expensive of them. It's even today, it's the most expensive because if you're up in, if you're up in, in Russia, the Esrogim had to be imported from Corfu or from Greece or from Eretz Israel. If it was really, right, they had to travel a distance and they were perishable items. I imagine my father coming to shul like a respectable balabas with his own esrog and lulav, and not using the congregations as did other poor people in town. When I hear, now here, in this case, it's not his own flag, it's the honor of his father. Because he knows that his kind of self-respect, it's all a family business, it's all a family operation. His self-respect is dependent on, on, his, father, on his father as well. When I heard this news, I could no longer restrain myself. And I told everyone in Cheder that this circus will have our own very own Esrug. But no one, you know, it's like today what happens, you know, you say, this Pesach, we're going on a cruise. <laughs> oh, yeah, this Pesach, we're going on a, someone showed me in Mishpocha magazine, on the back of the English Mishpocha magazine, there was a full page ad for Pesach. It's like amazing, it's like amazing. Does anyone stay home for Pesach? In other words, you think just from the, just from the advertisements, every single hotel and cruise ship in the world has given over to Pesach. One wonders how it is I haven't been invited as scholar in residence. So, I mean, just because there aren't enough scholars in residence to go around. So on the back of this ad, it said, there'll be, you know, mashkichim, of course, to make sure that, you know, that no matzah ball survives, right? For God forbid, so they got broke. And like, while you're eating your matzah of your soup, there'll be someone standing there with a bib, to make sure none falls in. We're going to hire someone to do that. And there's Rabonim and scholars in residence and Dafyomi and Badchanim and Leitzanim and entertainment. No, no, but no name. It doesn't tell you who's the rabbi that's going to be giving the Dafyomi and who's the rabbi that's leading the Seder. There's, there's only one. Oh, sorry, I, I can still get in. So there's only one name that's mentioned. Only one person has his name on this full page ad on the back of the Mishpacha magazine, and that is... The executive chef, Mike, of Mike's Bistro on the west side is going to be our in-house executive chef. Because that's taco, that's what's important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so how do we get, oh, so, so Sukkis will have our own extra. No one believes. Look who's getting his own esrug, some of my pals snickered. That pauper's going to buy himself his own esrug? He probably thinks it's a cheap lemon. You can get an esrug for a cheap lemon. He doesn't even know what he's talking about. Father handled the esrug. So anyway, they go. He buys the esrug. A few days before Sukkot, the esrug comes to the house. Father handled the aromatic esrug like a priceless object given to him for safekeeping. And which upon, and which upon pain of death, he dare not lose or damage. 
wrapped in flax. Remember when it used to come with the flax? No, no, now it comes in styrofoam. It's like that little... Wrapped in flax like a newly swaddled one, only child, the Esther was comfortably bedded down and finely laved, round and painted wooden box. The box was then placed in the cupboard, the glass door closed, and the Esther was bid goodbye, they tucking it in for the night. Mama took me by the hand and dragged me away from the cupboard. I'm worried, she said. The little rascal's likely to make a move for the cupboard. God forbid and bite off this now. The translation, both the translation I gave you and this translation, has a mistranslation. This bite off the stem. The stem is the part of the fruit that connects to the tree. In the Hebrew, in the Yiddish, it's the pitam, the, the spitz at the top, right? Which, you know, according to the halacha, if the etro gets damaged, it, it's pasul, it's invalid. Right? If somebody takes a bite out of it, it's invalid. And the part that's most susceptible to halachic invalidation is the little, is the little, is the little spitz, this little, this little, little, yeah, the, I'm trying to define pitam. You can't, right? You can't define pitam by saying pitam. The little, the little point that comes up at the at the top, right? The little, the chupchik. Yeah, yeah. There, you see there. This is what the, here's here's the pitam. Right, that's what the pitam looks like up on the up on the tippy top there, right? But the stem is on the other end. No, so they're, they're, they're etrogen without, and if it doesn't have a pitam, then that's okay. But if it has a pitam and the pitam becomes damaged, then it becomes pus. I'm worried, she said, the little rascal is likely to make a move for the cupboard. God forbid and bite off the pitam. Now, this idea of biting off the pitam actually has, like, why, like, why would you think you'd bite off the pitam? It turns out, it turns out that in the mystical literature, the Kabbalistic literature, the Hasidic literature, there is an idea of biting off the pitam. It's a smula. It's a good charm for fertility. Fertility for easy birth, for other things like that. And there are all types of concoctions that would be made for women who maybe were having trouble getting pregnant or women that were having trouble uh, with pregnancy or with morning sickness, whatever, of things made out of the, out of the etrog. So this idea of biting off the pitam, you know, it, it, it's an idea that's out there. But alas, I hovered around that cupboard like a cat that got a whiff of butter and restlessly paced back and forth, plotting what to do next. I looked through the glass door and going, oogling, and kept oogling the estrog box until Mama spotted me. The little devil's got an urge to make a move on the estrog, she told my father. Anyway, a day or so before Sukkot, he wakes one bright morning. The house was still. I opened the glass door, removed the box, lifted the cover. Before I even unwrapped the flax, the estrog's pungent and heavy fragrance pierced my nostrils. A split second later, the estrog was in my hands, and the stem, the pitam, leapt toward my face. Want a thrill? A taste of paradise? Here, bite me off, says the estrog. Don't be afraid, silly. No one will know. Would you like to know what happened? Did I bite off the, the pitam, or did I control myself? What would you have done if people had warned you a dozen times not to dare bite off the estrog's stem? Wouldn't you have wanted to know what it tasted like? Well, we know, of course, what he did. He bites it off, and then, like you, you described that, he bites it off, and then he realizes what he did. First of all, he bites it off, and whatever fantasy he had of the ambrosia that it would taste like, it's, of course, bitterly sour. And he realizes, oh, my God, what have I done? My father has just made this huge sacrifice. To buy this estrog. And the purchase of this estrog, besides the money, what did it buy? It didn't just buy him an estrog. It bought us status. It bought us respect. I am now the son of a Bala boss that has his own estrog. And doesn't need, well, he won't need to follow around all the other high and mighty and shul to borrow theirs. And I ruined it. I've defiled it. I've, I've, been hoisted on my own petard, my own, my own lack of my own my own childishness. What could be described as anything but my own childishness? Right. Once I saw it, I knew I had to have it. My lack of impulse. You know that famous experiment in psychology, the marshmallow test. Right. So here's the Esrog test. The second he's alone, and he and he 
and he blows it. Right? So what does he do? He quickly two, 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 sticks it back on with a little spittle. He glues it back on with a bit of spit, and he hopes it'll stick. And there it rests until the first morning of Sukkot. Now, they have a neighbor, the, the Zalman the carpenter, who's the, 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 the widowed father of many children, and the narrator's family, the narrator's mother tries to help take care of the children, and Reb Zalman helps them build the sukkah, and of course, in return, he'll have like first chance of borrowing the esrog. Reb Zalman, the carpenter, wants the esrog, and Lulav, Mama said to Father early on the morning of sukkahs, here, say the bracha, Father told Zalman. Be careful with the esrog, for God's sake, hold it gently, Zalman. Zalman, the carpenter, God bless him, was a soundly built name, a zaftig man, with a healthy pair of paws. Into these hands fell the fragrant and delicate esterich. So Father had good reason to tremble when Solomon grabbed the esterich, squeezed it right well, recited the first bracha, and mercilessly shook the lulav. Gently, gently, said Father, concerned for the esterich. Suddenly Father lunged forward and emitted an unearthly shriek. Oi! You savage, you boar! Father yelled at the carpenter, ready to kill him with a glance. Such a clout! Is an esterich an axe? You've just cut my throat without a knife. You've mangled my esterig. Look, there's the pizza, you savage, you clunk. We were all thunderstruck. Poor Zalman the carpenter stood motionless, unable to comprehend how such misfortune had befallen him. What could possibly have caused the pizza to sail off that way? He was certain he had held the esterig gingerly with the tips of his fingers. What a terrible calamity. You brute, you lout, shouted Mama, wringing her hands. She was also stupefied. A ne'er-do-well, she said with tears in her eyes. You ought to bury himself alive, sink into the earth while he's hale and hearty. I, too. Now again, now again, like the boy with the penknife, I, too, stood there petrified and trembling. I was pained by my father's sorrow, my mother's tears, Zalman's humiliation. I didn't know whether to leap for joy because God had performed a miracle for me and saved me from such trouble and catastrophe. To weep over my father's sorrow, my mother's tears, and Solomon's humiliation. Or to embrace Solomon the carpenter and rain kisses on his coarse hands for being my good angel, my deliverer, my redeemer. My glance went to father's white face, to mama's tears, to Solomon's hands. Solomon gaped at the esterig on the table, lying there as dead as a doornail, yellow as wax, stemless, lifeless, a corpse. A dead esterig. Father said, and his voice broke. A dead esrig, Mama repeated with tears in her eyes. A dead esrig, Zalman said, and looked at his hands as if to say, What a pair of paws! May they wither away. So again, it's like this perfectly crafted vignette. I mean, it's not great suspense, because you can almost see where it's going, particularly if you already know the, the template of, of what Shalom Aleichem does in these types of stories. But it's this case of the child's perspective of knowing how tenuous everything is. Here you have like a, a, a brief leg up in the system, and it's destroyed by your own, not hubris. You know, in, in so much of literature, it's hubris that brings, you know, arrogance that brings down the, the, down the downfall of the hero. But when, when, when the hero's a child, hubris isn't relevant. Children don't have hubris. They have childishness. They're mischievous. They're, they're child. They're children, right? And can you blame uh, when, when, when? Uh, look, you remember so many great Agdon stories, right? You know, Shnei Talmidei Chachamim Shayubi Reino, two scholars who were in our town. This tragic tale we, we learned it this summer, right? This tragic tale of these two great Torah scholars who were brought down low to their own personality flaws. Here, what's the personality for? He's a kid. He's a kid being a kid. And we, you know, we've all been kids, and we've all, you know, maybe many of us have had kids, right? So, you know, your kid does something. You know, if your kid had done this to you, right? Oh, I remember once I bashed up my, I just gotten my driver's license, right? I was one week driving, and I bashed up my father's sports car. Oh, boy, I bashed it up good. Well, that's true, and as in this case, it happens to be connected to a mitzvah object, 
But again, a kid smashes up his father's car, there's some other damage to some other object, which is not a mitzvah object. You could spin the story in the same way. So he had a child, let's sure, because the child is always going to let the other person take the, the, the father. The child lets the other kid take the beating for the pen knife, and it's, it's a miracle. He's his redeemer, salvation. So, uh, but, but here, and there's, again, in, in an adult story, it's the hubris, it's the personality flaw. That, but, but here, the child is being childish. Can you blame a child? For, so that, that's exactly the tragedy here. It's the child's very essence. And it's, with an adult, you can say, he's led to tragedy because of his arrogance. Right? Okay, so he gets what he deserves. But if you're punished, if you're a child and you're punished for being childish, Oh, then, then there's no sense to it. It's just the tragedy. It's just the tragedy of life. In the previous story, well, can we blame poor Tuple? What, what, what really got Tuple flag burnt? He had a he had a good job, right? He had a good you know he had a smart alecky retort to Yulik for the first and only time in his life, and because of that, Yulik arranges for his flag to be burnt. But even that, can you blame a kid for being a kid? No. Well, when Agdon gets the story, Agdon surely knew this story of Shalom Aleichem, but he also knew a dozen Hasidic tales with similar, with similar, uh, you know, uh, tropes. You know what a trope is? A trope is a kind of uh, element in a story that repeats throughout different literatures. In, 19, in Arab Sukkot, 19, 1947, Agnon writes a story called Ha'etrog, the Etrog. I've taught it here many times. The next year he writes a shorter story called Etrogoshel Otot Sadiq. In English it's called That Sadiq Etrog, which becomes the, together, the two stories, uh, both of which deal with, both of which deal with uh, an Etrog becoming Pasul, become the source material with which Shuli Rand crafts the film Ushpiz. Right? But in fact, Agnon was channeling older iterations of the theme as it appeared in Hasidic tales. When Rand first, first makes the movie Ushpizin, which came out like around 2000, 2004, Mashu uh, uh on the posters it said, based upon a story by S.Y. Agdon. So Shokin immediately sued him for, for copyright violation. I don't know if they sued him, they threatened, they wanted, they wanted to cut. And, and then they immediately like changed the posters and the PR to remove Agnon's name because he said, look, Agnon, Agnon is taking existing Hasidic tales about the Etrog that gets Pasul. Uh, and so my source really wasn't Agnon, it was the Hasidic tales. But in fact, it's, in fact it, is, it, is, it is through Agnon. In Agnon's story, in Agnon's story, the, in the Etrog story, which is after all not, not a children's story, it's a story told through the prism of an adult. Uh, there's a there's a uh, fellow in town. I'll, I'll cut the story short. There's a fellow in town. Uh, the story takes place in Yerushalayim in the in the 40s, and the actual rabbinic figure that that appears in the story is an actual is an actual uh, was an actual uh, historical character who was alive at the time the story was published. Uh, Agnon tells a story that. Uh, Again, we're meant to believe that it's him, that it's autobiographical. The morning of Yom Kippur, he goes into Me'a Sharim to buy a little of an esrog. Because in those days, you couldn't buy a little of an esrog in every supermarket. The shuk for Arba Minim was, and the old bookstores that were full of moldering, dusty, old, dark, damp books, which got to all the second-hand bookstores because Yidin came from Europe with all their Sifri Kodesh, all their Jewish books. And then they fell on hard times where they had to marry off a daughter and they would sell off their libraries to the second-hand booksellers, pennies on the dollar. Or they would go the way of all flesh after 120 years and sometimes Rahmanas, their children were less interested in the holy books and they sold them off you know, for nothing to the second-hand, gave them away again to the second-hand booksellers, you know, glad to just have somebody cart them off. And Yerushalayim was, you know, half of the books upstairs in Agnon's library were purchased in these second-hand uh, bookstores. And you could find real Matthias, uh Jewish books. But for the week between Yom Kippur and Sukkot, all of these damp, dusty old bookstores, uh, you know, shed their must and mold. and became bright and airy and fruity because they became 
the, the estrogir, this is the term agnon coin, the estrogir, the seller of the estrogim and the love him would come and set up in the in the bookstores. So, uh, agnon, it's a term that agnon crafted, etroger, right? A seller of etroger. Yeah. Um, so he goes to buy an estrog and he sees this this rabbi is in real life his name is Rav Shimon Polanski. It's called the Rav Mitiplik, buying an estrog and the you know how it is. Estrog, you know, different grades of estrogim. So there's this is kosher for a bracha, that one's kosher, that one's kosher aleph, kosher aleph aleph, lamahadrin, mahadrin, and mahadrin. So he goes in and he buys this simply, he sees this great rabbi buying a very simple estrogim. And the boicher, the cell assistant, rabbi, I'm surprised he's taking such a simple estrogim. The rabbi says, listen, not only, not only does the estrog have to be kosher, but the money with which you buy the estrog also has to be kosher. Anyway, long story short, on the morning of uh, the first day of Sukkot, the narrator has to walk over to that neighborhood uh, to daven because there was going to be a bris of someone that he knew. But he got confused. He thought davening was at the service was at one time, and in fact, it started later. So he gets there. He's the first one in shul. No one else is there. First day of Sukkot, except for this rabbi, who's engrossed over a whole bunch of books. And he gets up and he starts pacing around and he sees the narrator's Lulav and Esrug and says, would you mind if I said a bracha on your Lulav and Esrug? He says, you can take it, it's yours. He says the bracha and he gives it back. The narrator says, but listen, Rabbi, what happened to your Esrug? You had an Esrug and it was bought, not only was it kosher, but it was bought with kosher money. Rabbi says, you were there when I bought it. Yeah, I was there when I put your Esrug. And I'll tell you what happened. In our neighborhood, there's a Jew. I mean, you know how Jews are. He's irascible and he's grouchy and he's catchy and he's mean and he's, you don't want to see him coming, you want to walk the other way. But he's medakdik mitzvot. He's punctilious about the ritual observance. He bought himself an esrog for a king's ritz. And it's really in bed. In our neighborhood, you have people that are hungry, they don't have bread to eat, they don't have shoes to put on their children's feet. You know, this is an actual depiction of the poverty that was in Jerusalem in the in the early 40s. And he, you know, spent a, a fortune on an Esther, which is really just in poor taste. Well, this morning, this morning, he went, wherever he went, to mikveh before davening, and my wife heard screaming from this fellow's house. So she ran over there to see what happened. Well, his stepdaughter, of course it's always, you know, stepdaughter, his stepdaughter was playing with the etrog that he bought, and she dropped it, and the pitam broke, and her mother gave her such a smack, because she knows what's going to happen to her on account of this daughter she brought into the marriage from her first uh, husband. So the rabbi tells his wife, here, take my etrog. Bring it over there. And if he asks, tell the wife to tell him that the rabbi stopped by and he noticed your etrog was pasul and he gave you a new one so that you should have. Is this a white lie? No, is it? Yes, except he leaves out. In other words, what has he done? He's, in other words, it's the same story, but told not for this is a child who's the object of having made this etrog pasul, right? Who is saved by another adult, right? But the story is told from a different perspective. I mean, I, it occurred to me, maybe, maybe Agnon read Shalom Aleichem and decided to tell the story backwards. In other words, maybe there's a different version of, uh, of Shalom Aleichem's Etrog story in which Solomon the carpenter was looking through the window when the little boy bit off the Etrog. So what happens? First thing on Sukkot morning, before anybody's even opened this Etrog, he says, I want to be the first to bench the Etrog. And because of his hammy paws, it made it look like it. Now, I don't think this is what Shalom Aleichem meant, but you can imagine the story from a different perspective. So here the rabbi says, because what, what, it's a white lie. Because the, I mean, the etrog was puzzled because it fell, but it wasn't inherently at puzzle. 
uh, he wants the father to think the etrog was inherently invalid. So, but he says it was inherently invalid. Why was it inherently invalid? Because not only does the etrog have to be kosher, but the money has to be kosher. If you steal money and you use that money to buy an etrog, the etrog is. We have a constant myth that you steal an etrog. The etrog might be might be physically perfect, but it's got a flaw in it called mitzvah haba'a be'avera. You're trying to do a mitzvah through a sin. So the rabbi saying he's doing a mitzvah through what's the sin? The the, the arrogance in our in our circumstances to waste that fortune of money on an etrog when there are hungry people. It's a moral flaw that attaches itself to the to the etrog. So it's Agnon's telling of the same story, but this is not a ch- even as a child present. As a child is the is it is a kind of protagonist in the story in the sense that through the little girl's uh, 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 mishap, the etrog falls. But it's not a child story. For a child story that explores these themes, we have to look at Agnon's story Hamit Pachat. English as the kerchief. It's a story from 1932. You know the story? We've, we've, we've taught it a few times. When Agnon tells a story of a child, and again, here's the same thing. It could be a pen knife, it could be a Sikhastara flag, it could be a Sidur. Agnon has this lovely little story called uh, Sipuri, my bird, about this little, this little um, swallow or you know, little bird that, you know, hits the window and breaks its wing and they take it in and they nurse it back to health and, you know, this little bird that, you know, like, like it happens to so many children. You know, you find a bird's nest, you know, something like that. Like, it's like one of the most magical moments in, in childhood, right? To find, you know, to find like a living animal. And, you know, they didn't have pets. Pets was not a thing. People, you know, Jews didn't keep dogs, Bichlal, right? And if there was a cat, it was there for utilitarian purposes to get rid of the mice. But like, there's nothing more bad. I remember, I was a little kid. We, I grew up in again in New Jersey. Uh, there was like this little wooded this woods behind our house. There was this little creek, this little brook in the woods. I remember once I found a turtle, this little this little tortoise, I should say, right? And it was. Is there anything more magical than finding? You know, here's a perfect example of of what Ruskies was saying about using childhood as the prism through which to tell stories. You can recapture magic. What could be more magical? To a little kid, I was, in, I was in first grade. So what are you, five years old, six years old, right? And you find a turtle, right? A turtle. So I just like, man, I remember I took it to school, like for show and tell. And there was this, there was a yulik, there was this bully, and he said we were on the playground, and he said, do you want me to take it out of its shell? I didn't know because you know in the cart go go back to Bugs Bunny. You know in the cartoons the turtle comes and the turtle goes wants to take a shower. It gets out of its shell. It goes in the shower. It towels off. It gets back in the shell. And I thought maybe could be. I don't think so. I'm not sure. But all the other kids on the you know in Cheder. I mean this is a little public school in New Jersey, but I'll tell the stories if it was Cheder. So so all the other kids are saying yeah yeah take it out of the shell take it out of the shell take it out of the shell. So I'm like yeah. And the turtle's like, the neck is like stretching out inches, and like turtles can't talk, but like I can hear it screaming. And I got so panicked, I said, give me my turtle, give me my turtle, give me my turtle. And I kid you not, through high school, every time I saw this kid, he would go up to me, give me my turtle, give me my turtle. (laughs) And would you believe, not two, three, four years ago, he friended me on Facebook. He wanted to be my, wanted to be, I'm like, why would I, I wasn't your friend then on the, the playground, why do I want to be your friend now on Facebook? What? The turtle, my, and my, my parents, after a while, maybe release, you know, born free, release it back into the, into the wild. So, so Agnon does it. He's a story of this little bird, you know, that it may or may not be autobiographical, that's not the point, but you can tell. You can, so here Agnon has, Agnon has another lovely little story, which we've learned a few times. About his, you know, he's a bar mitzvah boy getting his fill in like the thrill, the magic of, of getting, you know, your tefillin, you know, if the pen knife makes you feel like a, an adult, so the tefillin really does. So here, in another bar mitzvah story called The Kerchief, and again, it starts off with this idea that the father goes off to the fair. His father was, Agnon's father was a merchant. He was a fur merchant, and from time to time, he'd have to go up to these regional trading fairs. He goes off to Leskovitz, and when he used to go to Leskovitz, he used to sleep in his bed when I was a little boy. As soon as I had said good, the the, the night prayer, I said, Kriyachma, 
I used to undress and stretch my limbs on his long bed, cover myself with my ears and keep them pricked up and ready so that in case I heard the trumpet of the Messiah, I might rise at once. It was a particular pleasure for me to meditate on Melech HaMashiach, on the Messiah. Sometimes I used to laugh to myself when I thought of the consternation that would come about in the, in the, whole, in the whole world when Mashiach Tzitkenu would reveal himself. Only yesterday he was binding his wounds and his bruises, and today he's a king. Yesterday he sat among the beggars, and they did not recognize him, but sometimes even abused him and treated him with disrespect. And now suddenly a Kaddish Baruch Hu has remembered the oath he swore to redeem Israel, and given him permission to reveal himself to the world. Another in my place might have been angered at the beggars who treated Melech HaMashiach with disrespect, but I honored and revered them, since Mashiach, the Messiah, had desired to dwell in their quarters. In my place, another might have treated the beggars without respect, as they eat black bread even on the Sabbath and wear dirty clothes. Just like in the now, he doesn't have to. He doesn't have to. He doesn't have to plagiarize that line from Shlomo Eichem, right? They both came. They both drew this from real life. But I honored and revered them, the, the poor ones, the paupers, since among them were those who had dwelt together with the Messiah. So here, the little boy is telegraphing to us. A Gemara in Masechet Sanhedrin, Daf Sadi Chet Omer Aleph, 98a. Go home and look it up. It's a rather well-known agada about Mashiach and when Mashiach will come. Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi going and trying to find Mashiach to ask him, "No, gay came in. When are you coming already? The, the, the Jews need you. So where is the Messiah? This is this midrashic idea that the Messiah, you know, who lives in each and every generation? That the Messiah is in disguise. You know, this is a trope which is picked up in so many Hasidic tales. That Mashiach or Eliyahu Anavi or the Rabbi himself is amongst us in hiding. The Seder. And this, in fact, was the practice of many Hasidic masters. To go out in disguise, dressed as paupers, to experience the world as his Hasidim would have, would have known it. So Mashiach is dwelling at the gates of Rome, sitting among the paupers and lepers. And what do they do, the paupers and lepers? Well, you know, they have the leprosy. They have the, the, the wounds. So on the bare skin, they expose the skin to, to the sunlight, right? So what do they do? They have, they have their, their old, you know, their, old, their bandages, their shmatas that... that, that you know, are wrapped up around their limbs, and they sit in the in the daylight, and they unwrap their bandages to, to expose it to the sunlight, which is meant to be healing. So, of all of these schleppers and schnorrers and beggars and lepers, how do you know which of them is Mashiach? There's a sign. All of the lepers unwrap their bandages from their right arm, their left arm, their right leg, their left leg, and sit there sunbathing. Mashiach only unwraps one limited time. Because maybe he'll hear the shofar of redemption and he'll know it's time to go off and save the Jews. And that way he's ready to go. He doesn't have to wrap himself all up. He can, he's, 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 you know, he sleeps with his boots on, as it were. So that he's ready to go redeem the Jewish people at a moment's, at a moment's notice. So he's laying there in bed while his father is gone. Whenever father is absent is a kind of strenuous time. The absence of father from the home is the absence of authority. The absence of father from home is a difficult circumstance because his mother is in this kind of limbo position. After all, Agnon is someone who takes his pen name from the concept of Agunot. Not Agunot the way that we use it colloquially today, a woman whose husband's a wicked fellow and won't give her a divorce. But the classical Aguna whose husband, the woman whose husband just disappeared, goes off to the fair, goes off on a journey, and never comes home. You understand that the way we use agunot today, which technically the, these women are called, are, are, no, 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 technically the women today are not agunot. They are, I mean, there are classical agunot. But a woman, a woman who's, whose husband, we know where the husband is. She's technically a misurevet get. She's being denied her divorce. But she's not a cla- in a classical halachic sense. An aguna is a woman who, it's, you understand, it's emotionally opposite experiences. In the contemporary sense, 
she hates the guy. We all hate the guy. And if we could whack him and force him to do the right thing, she'd be, she'd be free of him. In the classical sense, she loves him. She longs after him. She sits at the window every day anticipating his return. Every time there's a footstep at the door, she jumps up and says, maybe it's him, maybe it's the back. You understand how these... So for Agnon, the Aguna becomes, the classic Aguna becomes a metaphor of the condition of the Jewish people. If in the rabbinic, uh, in the, if in the rabbinic midrash, God is the bride, God is the groom, and the Jewish people are the bride, and the Torah itself is the is the ketuba, and Har Sinai is held up above us like a chupa. Where are we meant to be living together? What's our what's our marital home? Eretz Yisrael or Beit Hamikdash, right? So the Jewish people and God, well, we're not exactly divorced, but we could use a little marital counseling because for 2,000 years we haven't been living together. And Agnon is writing these stories at the time when the Jewish people are returning to Eretz Yisrael and asking questions of what does it mean that this dysfunctional couple, God and the Jewish people, should once again be living together in their marital home of the land of, in the land of, of Israel. So here's the little boy. He's sitting in bed. And either because he knows this Gemara, or it's just, again, part of the myth of Jewish life, right? It's embedded in Jewish life, this idea of anticipating and waiting for Messiah. And he knows that, you know, they're poor people. How does he know there's poor people? Because he's a Jewish kid in Eastern Europe at the end of around the year 1900. And Agdon's Bar Mitzvah, if this is autobiographical, Agdon's Bar Mitzvah would have been Parshat Ekev, the summer of 1900. So he knows their point. Now, he happens not to be one, because he's from a well-to-do family. But he knows that there are poor people. And he knows, you know, poor people, you know, like Topol. Maybe Topol is a kid in his head there. And maybe something happened with his, his flag. And he knows that last week in Chay there, a kid got beaten for stealing some kopecks from the pushke because he wanted a pen knife. Because... You know, I mean, I understand why a kid wants to. I have a pen knife. My father brought me a pen knife from the fair, right? But I understand why a kid might want a pen knife. But the, the Agnon, the, the, the child that we're meant to believe was Agnon, is no Yuluk. He's a nice boy. He understands why, why, why the poor kid might want to, might want to, might, might be tempted to steal a few kopecks for a pen knife. Because with a pen knife, you're a real person. Right? And it's a way for a poor kid. You're somebody. Right? You have your own Simpastora flag. Your father has his own history. So he's thinking about the poor people. He says, you know, a lot of, I look around, I see a lot of people, they're not so nice to the poor people, but I'm nice to the poor people. I respect, you know why I respect the poor people? Because I know that Mashiach, he chooses to hang out with those poor people in the gates of in the gates of Rome. Well, where are we? Here we are. One day, Father comes home from the fair, and he brought many gifts. He was very clever, knowing what each of us would want and bring to us. Or maybe the master of dreams used to tell Father what he showed us in a dream, and he would bring it to us. I apologize. I realize it's a drop later than usual, but we just have to finish up. I hope you'll bear with me. There were not many gifts that survived long. As was the way of valuables in this world, they were not lasting. Yesterday, we were playing with them, and today, they're already thrown away. Even my fine prayer book was, no, was, was torn. This, this, you know, he's, he's, he's making reference to this earlier story that he'd written. For whatever I might have had to do, I used to open it and ask it for counsel, and finally, nothing was left of it but a few dog-eared scraps. But one present that Father brought Mother remained whole for many years, and even after it was lost, and it, lost it was not lost to my heart. I still think of it as though it were there. He brought her a mitpachat, a kerchief, a silk brocaded kerchief, which was embroidered with flowers on it. And, and she wore her kerchief. When, when, when I used to look at my mother on Yom Kippur, when she wore her kerchief and her eyes were bright with prayer and fasting, she seemed to me like a prayer book, like a sidur bound in silk presented to a bride. 
this, this reverence for the mother and the father. It's, it's fascinating. Agno never felt the need to introduce the typical type of family tensions in parent-child relations that are so typical throughout literature, including in Yiddish literature, including in English literature. Right? He, he didn't feel the need to spice that. The rest of the time, the kerchief lay folded in the cupboard, and on Erev Shabbat and Chag, mother would take it out. I never saw her washing it, although she was very particular about cleanliness. When Shabbat and Chag and Yom Tov are properly kept, they themselves preserve the clothes. <laughs> not in my house. But for me, she would have kept it. It's like impossible not to like spill a cup of grape juice right on the table. For me, she would have kept the kerchief all her life long and would have left it to left it as an heirloom. It happened but as this follows. On a day I became bar mitzvah and a member of the congregation, my mother, Allah Shalom, bound her kerchief around my neck. Blessed be God, who has given his world to guardians. There was not a spot of dirt to be found on the kerchief, but sentence had already been cast on the kerchief, and it was to be lost through me. Right? So she fastens it, you know, like a like a like a cravat or something, right? It must have been all the fashion. The kerchief which I had observed so long and so long would vanish because of me. Anyway, he goes to Shul, it's the day of his bar mitzvah, meaning that's not the Shabbat, it's the it's the the weekday in which he actually became thirteen. At that time there came a beggar to our town who was sick with running sores, his hands were swollen, his clothes were rent and tattered, his shoes were cracked, and when he showed himself in the street the children threw earth and stones at him. And not only the children, but even the grown ups and householders turned angry faces on him. Once when he went to the market to buy bread or onions, the shopwoman drove him away in anger. Shalom, you understand? Not that the shopwomen in our town were cruel. Indeed, they were very tender-hearted. Some would give the food from their mouths to orphans. Others went to the forest, gathered twigs, made charcoal of them, and shared them free among the beggars and the poor folk. But every beggar has his own luck. This is, this is similar to the story I told you last week about the two women in Efrat. Right? You know, one seems to do better than the other even though the other seems to need it maybe a bit a bit more. In other words, the child, again, it's, the, it's the, the child's point of view. There's a real dissonance here. Our town is a town full of righteous, holy, good, deed-doing folk. And they give food from their mouths to the poor. This fellow, he can't get a scrap of bread. And on Shabbos, who knows where he eats because nobody invites him in. So, wait a second. You can't have it both ways. But the child, you know, he doesn't have to put it all on the table. He doesn't have to spell out the next step. And apparently our assumption about the quality of mercy in our town, it might not be what I imagine it to be. Now, I'll stop telling you a story about the beggar, and I'll tell you only about my mother's kerchief, which she tied around my neck when I entered the Age of Commandments and was to be counted among a member of the congregation. On that day, when I returned from the Beit Medrash to eat the midday meal, I was dressed like a chatan, I was dressed like a bridegroom, and was very happy and pleased with myself because I was now putting on film. On the way, I found that beggar sitting on a heap of stones, changing the bandages of his sores, his clothes rent and tattered, nothing but a bundle of rags which did not even hide his sores. In other words... What symbol has he made this beggar? The beggar is the Mashiach in disguise. Now, we don't mean that the beggar, in fact, really is the Mashiach. But the reader is meant to put two and two together, right, and understand the symbolism here. He looked at me as well. The sores on his face seemed like eyes of fire. My heart stopped, my knees began shaking, my eyes grew dim, and everything seemed to be in a whirl. Now, earlier, while Father was gone and he was sleeping in his bed, he had a dream. In the dream, a wild bird comes and picks him up and carts him off to Rome, to a city, to a city called Rome. Now, the child's not even sure where that is or what it is. He's just aware there is such a city. In other words, <laughs> in other words the child seems to know that Gemara very well. But he doesn't know it from the Gemara. He knows it just because he's absorbed these, again, what I call the myth of the story of the, of the Jewish experience. 
So in my dream, this bird carries me off to Rome, and he shows me these pickers. And I'm horrified. When I, when I was a kid, everything comes back to my suburban New Jersey. When I was a kid, the next-door neighbor was this old man who, who had a stroke. And he, um, they used to, you know, like the aide used to, like, put him out on the front porch. You know, he used to, um, unless it was rainy, he used to sit out there all day. And he was in this wheelchair, and he was kind of, like, strapped in so that he wouldn't, I guess, hunch over. So he had like this, you know, he was, he was kind of like, like his arm, like he was like belted in the wheelchair like this. And he, he lost most of his speech. So we were kids. So you'd have to walk past his house to go to and from school. And you'd walk past the house and he would, he would shout out, whir, 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 whir. it was apparently the only thing he could say. So we called him the Wurra Wurra Man. You know, because we were kids and we were cruel and we but we were afraid. We were afraid of it. Plus he had a dog. His little yappy dogs used to bark every time the kids played. So he's a little kid. In the dream, he's confronted with a beggar with sores, with pus, with you know the whole works. And in the dream, he hides his face because he can't bear to look. And then he's rescued in the dream. His father comes and picks him up and puts him back into bed. But what? Father was still away. It's a dream within the dream. He's rescued from the nightmare by a dream in which his father comes and saves him. And when he wakes up for real, he knows father is still away at the fair, and we're still in this difficult position of being away from father. Because again, remember, father is the symbol of authority, of father here, Tate, here at home. But he's also, of course, Abinu Sheba Shemayim, our father in heaven. And distance from father in heaven is similarly a bad situation. So now, here it is, he's Bar Mitzvah. And he confronts a beggar. My eyes grew dim. Everything seemed to be in a world. And as he's faced in waking life with the same test that, w- that was posed to him in Nightmare Dream. And so I stood staring in front of me. The sun stopped still in the sky. Not a creature was to be seen in the street. But he, God, in his mercy, sat in heaven and looked down upon the earth and let his light shine bright on the sores of the beggar. I began loosening my kerchief to breathe more freely, for tears stood in my throat. Before I could loosen it, my heart began racing in strong emotion, and the sweetness which I had already felt doubled and redoubled. I took off the kerchief and gave it to the beggar. He took it and wound it around his stores. The sun came and stroked my head. In other words, now when faced with the real test, in real life, in waking life, he passes. He's able to look the beggar in the eye, and he's able to help him. He's able to give to him freely with charity. Except what? It's his mother's prized possession. In other words, Agnon, what Shalom Aleichem didn't do, what Shalom Aleichem really couldn't do even had he wanted to, Agnon takes similar themes, similar vignettes, similar circumstances, but he filters it through a much more profound theological register. Not just because Shalom Aleichem's characters are the type that can interweave a Gemara and Sanhedrin into their kind of daily speech. Because Shalom Aleichem wasn't a Jew like that, but Agnon was. But they're doing different things. You see how Agnon raises the level of one of these vignettes from the story of a flag or a pen knife or, a, or an esrug to something so much more theologically charged where the redemption of the Jewish people are at stake, not just the redemption of the Jew. Right? For the little boy, knowing that Zalman the carpenter took the fall for him or that the other poor kid took the fall for the pen knife, right? so they're redeemed. Solomon is his, is his Mashiach, but only his, and in a rather false and unearned way. In this story, 
it spins as a metaphor for the entirety of the Jewish people. And there's a story written in the 1930s at a time when the Jewish people are starting to come back where thought of redemption, not, not, uh, not messianic redemption, but the redemption of the Jewish people from their condition in Europe through the aspiration of Jewish nationalism, the story can be read on many different, different levels. Well, now what's he going to do? He has to go home and he has to confront his mother. Boy, boy, is he going to get a whapping, a whacking for, 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 for what he did to her purchase. I stood there a while, a minute or two or more. Finally, I moved from thence and entered the house. When I entered, I found mother sitting in the window as was her way. Now, earlier he had told us that mother never sat at the window. Who sits at, what kind of woman sits at the windowsill? Gossipers. Well, sister's mother sits at the window, but we're going to come to that in a second. But in other words, he says, he says women, women would sit at the window. Women, now, you remember, we were in Ukraine. You remember what the houses looked like? Remember the, the house that they said was Agnon's house, right? The windows, they were these low windows right on the street. So you sat at the window. You saw what's happening, and you could tell gossip with the passersby. So says, my mother never sat. The only time my mother sat at the window was when father was away. Because sitting at the window, a trope that he borrows from Sefer Shoftim, from Sisra's mother, sitting at the window, if you're not a gossiper, sitting at the window is a sign of, and no, of anticipation, anticipating here in the story on the level of the simple meaning, return of father, but it's anticipating redemption. So he says, my mother never sat at the window unless she was anticipating Return redemption. So here I find her sitting at the window as, as her way, but it wasn't her way. It was only her way when she was anticipating redemption. Why is she anticipating redemption? Oh, I greeted her and she returned my greeting. Suddenly I felt that I had not treated her properly. She had had a fine kerchief with which she used to bind around her head on Shabbat and Yom Tov, and I had taken it and given it to a beggar to bind up his feet with. Ere I ended asking her, forgive me, she was gazing at me with love and affection. I gazed back at her, and my heart was filled with the same gladness as I had felt on that Shabbat when my mother had set the kerchief about her head for the first time. The end of the story of the kerchief of my mother, in other words, why is mother not angry? Because she's, whether she's soon as, but the whole thing is a test. He passes the test, right? He knows what he's supposed to do. Right? She's a willing accomplice, even though he didn't know it at the time. Right? That he should take her mitpachat and use it for this righteous, charitable cause. Right? And she, maybe she saw, maybe she didn't. But she's sitting at the window because sitting at the window is 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 is, a, is anticipating redemption. Right? And he has now, in the dream before his bar mitzvah. He covers his face. It's a failure, and he has, to be re- he has to be rescued by his father. In real life, he passes the test. What? What? The day of his bar mitzvah. Now you. Now you are a fountain pen. Now you are a man, right? No more pen knife. Now you get. Now you get the. Now you. Now you get the fountain pen, right? In other words, Tati can't save you anymore. You're now responsible for your own actions, but actions, they're actions, ritual actions, you're now responsible to put on still and you're responsible for this other stuff, but action is also action in the larger, well, chesed, well, chesed is, is a kind of, uh, of mitzvah, but you're also, you're also responsible for action on the larger national scale, but in other words, again, Shalom Aleichem keeps things focused on the family, on the shtetl, on the on Tevya, on the little boy, on, on, on Topol. Agnon's stories are midrashic in the sense that they can carry multiple valences and they can be read on different levels. And maybe this is a critique on what I had said uh, two weeks ago, that old kind of Jewish notion, Yidin, don't just stand there doing nothing. Zog Dilim, right? No. In other words, if we're interested in promoting redemption, either divine redemption or simply rescuing ourselves here in 1932, as we're coming back to Eretz Yisrael. So he's also saying something about the fact that action must be taken. People have to act. 
we can't expect to be rescued deus ex machina, you know, like like Rebutal of last week, or rooster ex machina, or in this case, Abba ex machina. Abba cannot save us, right? We have to be responsible. It's not that Abba can't save us, but we can't rely on Abba because we have to be reliant on our on ourselves. So Agnon takes the story and and what? No, no, no. It's with a tough, not a tip. Ted, not a tough. Play on words. Mit, mit pachat. No, mit pachat is... is, is <laughs> It's not mistachet, it's mitpachat, mitpachat. It's a completely different shorish. You want to make a play on words? I don't know, maybe, I don't know. So that's, these are some of the common themes between, between Agdan and Shalom But these are the really the common themes of, of Jewish life and Jewish literature and Jewish experience. And, uh, you know, we could have done this by, by really looking at any two authors that are worth, that would be worth, worth looking at. Uh, we saw how poverty was such a rampant feature in the Jewish world. Even for an author like Agnon depicting his own childhood, which happens to have been maybe uh, exceptionally uh, exceptionally uh, uh, well off, uh, but, but it affected everything. It affected the Jewish condition. That was the story of, of Bancho Schweig, which we looked at from Peretz uh, two weeks ago, that it's, poverty doesn't just make you hungry, right? It causes you to forget to aim high. If all you can think about is a little a little bread with some butter, a warm piece of bread with butter, well, then you're really a goner. Uh, and then how the condition of faith was affected in the Jewish world in the periods depicted from the 19th, 20th, early 20th centuries. What miracle is, what it means to rely on a miracle, what it means to be engaged with, talking to, arguing with God, as Evi does, as, as Reb Yudel does. And then, of course, what do we do when we try to look at everything else from the opposite end of the telescope, from the eye of the child? Well, none of us can see anything through the eye of the child because none of us any longer are children. And in that regard, none of these stories, no matter how they're depicted or how they're illustrated and sold in the children's shelf of the book, Bookstore and other Rabbi, we should encourage our children and grandchildren to read these stories because they can be enjoyed, you know, at that level. But really, these are not children's stories. These are stories about the Jewish people told through the perspective of children who can still experience the wonder that we have all lost. Because that is the condition of modernity that we've all lost to one degree or another, that sense of, of wonder as we look about the world, the Jewish world that was, and even the Jewish world that is. So I hope that we'll have opportunities to learn again.